radically changed my life. <laughs> uh, many years ago, I was in a place where it's like, okay, I don't know what's happening in this world, but I am completely confused, Lord, what you're doing, or even if you exist, uh, because it was the difficulties in my life were so uh, crazy that I just I could not get a grasp on how God, how could you be in the midst of this? How could you even be doing this? How could you be even active in this? I don't see you anywhere. I'm totally confused. And and it was and that's when I knew. Okay, clearly, number one, either God does not exist, which is not an option for me, uh, or number two, there's something I don't know about Him. And wow, imagine that if there's something that we don't know. Are we, you know, arrogant or what? Uh, so clearly I took the second option thinking there must be something about God that I am not aware of uh, because right now I can't see him. <laughs> I'm completely blind to him. So whatever is happening in that, I have to figure out who, what is he? Who is he? What is he like? So that I can figure out in my circumstance, where is he in this? And, and that I pursued for several years. So I, what I did was I got together several women because I was desperate, mind you. Um, very desperate, and hi, come on in. Do you know who your group leader is? Not yet. Well, Not yet, we'll okay. Connect that you could come right over here by Tanya and Brandon. They'd be happy to have you. <laughs> um, so, uh, what I, as I was saying, because of the desperateness of my desire to understand where is God in my life, I, I just am not, and this is after I've been a Christian for like 20 years, um, but as we've talked before, pain brings in confusion, doesn't it? Pain will so quickly cause us to go, okay, life is nuts and I don't even know if God's in it. Uh, because pain does that to us. It makes everything confusing. So I thought, I've got to know him. I've got to know him better because I can't live with the idea that he does not exist. But right in this situation, I can't see him. So I've got to find out where is he in this. So I got these women around me and I said, I am very, very serious about studying who God is and I mean, I am so desperate for it that I'm to the place where I need women who are willing to dive into something that's going to be extremely difficult. There's going to be times when we go, uh, no, that can't be. That it's going to challenge everything we thought about Christianity or who God is or what our doctrine is or anything else. I knew it would do that. I knew it was going to shake up our life in a way that I really needed to be shaken up at that point in time. So I needed women who would come alongside of me and say, yep, we're, we're in. We're willing to do this. And some of them would not do it because this is a scary place to go. I'm not kidding you. It will change the way you see life, the way you see God, the way you see your purpose in life. It better because the study, there is no, nothing any more important than the study of God himself. That is, that is what we're here about. We're all here because we believe we are alive because God is alive. So what could be more important than knowing that God who created us and has a purpose for us. There is no other point in life that is more valuable than that one. So if you are really serious about wanting to, to go further with God than you've ever been before, further in understanding his purpose in your life and his purpose in the world, his purpose in the chaos, all of that, then you are, you are in the right spot. But it will hurt. Let me tell you that. It will, your brain will hurt. <laughs> Sometimes your heart will hurt because it's, it's like, that's not what I thought. That's not what I thought about him. And we are, we are not here to say we have the information. We're here to say, no, we're searching as well. And we want scripture to identify some things I think that we've missed. And Tozer does a really good job of packaging that to get us to think. I, we're going to think beyond what your brain has taken you before. Beyond what the spirit of God has taken you before. I promise it. I promise it. You, 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 God wants us to know him. And so we cannot jump into this particular stream without being swept away with the stream and, and or being overwhelmed at what we see and what we find there. So uh, I, I'm thankful that you're here. And I, that was just somewhat of a warning and a, and, a, and a gracious thank you to say, I love the fact that you're willing. Uh, and maybe you want to leave now. <laughs> I don't know. I hope not after what I've said. But I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's worth whatever it is. And we're studying Romans in the fall. So this is really going to be helpful when we get into the, uh, to the uh, major, major um, theological aspects of the book of Romans. So I can guarantee we have all thought wrongly of God, all of us. We all, you know, on a daily basis, think of him wrong because we are limited in our ability to comprehend such a being. And we don't even think about that being in the right way, much less to understand that being. But that's what we want, to, we want to do here. We want to think about him in the right way. At least start with the right foundations. Because if we don't, everything after that crumbles. 
if we don't start on the right foundation. So um, that's why we're here, and as I said, that's my explanation for why you're actually studying a book at Pursue, because we just don't do that. Now, the books, uh, we tried for everything we could because we don't like charging for books. I don't like doing that, and yet I understand that when there is when you use a book as a framework, it, it does create a cost. So actually, Brandy and Cherie have been the ones who bought the, the books for us. The books are worth $4, but we're only taking donations. So it's whatever. If you don't have it to give, don't even think twice about it. If you want to give a dollar, I don't care. The, the, the jars or the cups are in your table, and there's some new copies of that. The print is pretty small. There's some used copies where the print is a little bit bigger. They were the same price one way or the other. And then there, we gave you, hopefully your leader sent you a free download. If you're here new and didn't know about the free download, there is that. So we wanted to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to get the material because all of the lessons are on the, the chapters of the, of the book. So that's not the that's not lesson. <laughs> uh, so today, this is what's very difficult, is today we are doing um, the first three chapters. Just today. And then from here on out, you will do four chapters. Fortunately, his chapters are like three pages. Uh, uh, but they're, they're deep chapters. I mean, they're, they're difficult. But, but um, because to get this into six weeks, there was 23 chapters. So we had to break it into six weeks. Today, it's just kind of going to be an introduction as to why we think this is a significant study. And so what we're going to be doing is, is today, I'm going to talk about chapter one really quickly, just to give an introduction. Uh, and the prologue, and then you guys are going to go into your groups and you're going to read chapters two and three together and go through the questions together in the group, okay? Um, next week, it'll probably be the switched way around. You'll probably go to your group. I'm not sure how Sheree's going to do that, but... Um, and then you will do the chapter because you will have already done them ahead of time. The problem is here, this first week you haven't done them, so you have to do them in your groups. But next week, when you come with the lesson done, you will go into your groups and then we'll do the lecture or whatever it is afterwards, however uh, we choose to do that. So. Um, that because you'll already have it done. So you can go directly to your groups and like we normally do. All right, so um, I, I do want to read a couple things. I know it seems like I'm already rambling, but um, <laughs> uh, there's some things I wanted us to get started off on this. this my, my heart is like about to jump right out of my chest right now over this day. <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you. Uh, I can't. Uh, hopefully, you know, God will do in you what he's He's done in me as far as show me. Uh, there are there simply are no words to identify who it is that we say we serve. Our problem is is that we say we serve this guy and we don't know him. We don't really get who it is that we're dealing with here, and we need to get it much more clearly. So that's our goal here. And and I couldn't. I don't think there's anything more valuable to do than what we're doing right now. This this really is the most valuable thing you could do. Now I want to read to you a couple after I pray, I want to read to you a couple things that other people have said before we get started on, on uh, the prologue and the questions. Come on, sit up here if you want. You're okay? Okay. Um, uh, so that we can breeze, because I want to give you as much time in your group as you can, because it's going to be time consuming. And the goal here is that you will, will have other women around you that can, that can, we can ask the hard questions. We can, we can discuss it. That doesn't mean we say we have all the answers, but we can ask the questions. We can, and we can probe the scripture. Uh, for for God to speak, so we are we we're gonna we're gonna be uh, it, it's gonna be awesome. I'm telling. You. So just hang in there with us. So let's pray, and then we will get started on this journey. Father in heaven, I I feel so inadequate to even speak these things because you are beyond above anything we could ever comprehend or speak to rightly. But you have called us to know you. That, that in itself, after doing this study, is, it, it's, it's an amazing reality. The fact that a God like you, the God that you are, desired for human beings to know you and to be actively involved in your life is incomprehensible. And yet that, that's what you've invited us to do. In fact, you, you've sent your son to die for so that that very thing could happen. But we have to come knowing that you are the giver. We have nothing to offer you. We have nothing to give you. You are perfect just as you are. We come to get what you have 
for us, your creation. And so we thank you that we can come boldly, because of who Jesus is, we can come boldly to your throne of grace to find help, because our need is to know you, and only you by your spirit can reveal who you are. So I pray, Father, that you will do a mighty work in our hearts, a mighty work so that we not only can praise you well, that we can identify fully who you are, at least in our capabilities, but then we can proclaim it in a way that others will desire it and they'll understand how awesome our God really is. Thank you for this opportunity. I pray for the power of your spirit to work in a fantastic way in every one of us and that you would use Tozer as a framework for your word to be validated to our hearts. Thank you again for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I listened to, uh, and I mentioned this with my leaders and sent it to Cherie as well, uh, there's a man uh, called the name, by his name is David Platt, and he's written several books. But he uh, runs what's called uh, the, I don't know what the actual name of his church is, but he has also what's called the Secret Church. And he, they minister, they do uh, video things. What? Not the book, not the, the not the secret, no, it's called the Secret <laughs> Church. It, this is on, um, what's the name of the, what, the Right Now Media. Right Now Media. That is through the church. So if you go to Right Now Media and type in Secret Church, it's going to come up with uh, this David Platt, and he has a whole session on who is God, and it's like, whoo, really long, and he just flies through. You think I talk fast? I am like really slow. Here to him. So, uh, um, it, this, so, but he said something profound as I was listening to him that I want us to start out with um, after I read this, this scripture as to why we are here. Uh, all of you undoubtedly are familiar with the book of Jeremiah, and you know that the book of Jeremiah is a lamenting uh, by the prophet Jeremiah over the state of Israel because Israel is about to be disciplined because of her wrong ideas of God. That's really what it is. God has, has set apart the nation of Israel and revealed himself to her specifically and yet in that process she has distorted who he is and, and now committed idol worship. Not just in worshiping other, other idols but in the way they worship him. They have profaned his name and he is going after many, many years he is finally going to send them away to discipline them to get them to understand who he is and so Jeremiah is proclaiming this to the nation get ready because judgment's coming and you have not seen anything you do not want to even begin to, to I have an idea of what it's going to be like to have God's judgment on you but you have rejected him you've rejected the idea of him and you have worshipped him falsely purposely intentionally chasing after other gods and blending the ideas of what the other gods have given you and made Yahweh, your God, an image after your own heart is what you've done. So does that sound like America? I'm telling you, that's, that's it. I, Jeremiah could be speaking to us today. So in that process, if you have a Bible, I'm in Jeremiah chapter 9. Um, in verse 3, now this is, after, this is Jeremiah, and my subject to the title on that, on chapter 9, is a lament over Zion, which Zion is Jerusalem. And this is, again, this is Jeremiah weeping and mourning over what is about to happen because Israel has rejected her God of who he really is. And this isn't, because they're still worshiping him, they're just wor worshiping him falsely. That's what's happening here, is they're blending the concepts of the world with the idol worship with their idea of who God is. And this is detestable to God because he's nothing like their idols. Not, and they have made him an image after themselves. And this, so now this, Jeremiah is lamenting over what's going to happen to them because of that. And he says, uh, starting in verse 3, chapter, uh, chapter 9, I'm sorry, uh, Jeremiah 9. Uh, and uh, again, all of that previous part has been him telling them what's going to happen and why it's going to happen. And then in verse 3 he says, and they bend their tongue like their bow. Lies and not truth prevail in the land. For they proceed from evil to evil. And that word evil means bad in a moral or ethical sense. So really what he's saying is, is lies and truth prevail. You've chosen lies over the truth. And you're proceeding from evil to even more evil. It's a digression of evil. Continuing propagating evil because of what you're believing. You're propagating evil in this wrong concept of who God is. And then it says, and they do not know me, declares the, God, de declares the Lord. That's the problem, is they do not know me. That's why evil continues to be propagated, because they don't know me. They're, they're proclaiming me to be something I am not. This is why we're here today. I believe in America, in the world today, culture has caused us to 
worship God in a way that is not correct, and it causes us to go from evil to evil. And we're no longer exalting the truth about God. We are exalting our idea of God. That is blasphemy, whether we know that or not. So, and, and we're all there, and we all want to, that's why we're here. The God of grace has called us to know him better. That's why we're here. Then if we jump, and so he's warning them of that. So if you jump over then to verse 23 of that same chapter, he goes on to talk about how this is happening. And then it says, thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might, and let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So let him boast that he understands. And that word understands means to have, in, to be intelligent and to consider rightly. That's what that word means. So it means to be intelligent about what you understand about God because he delights when we know the truth about him. That's what he's saying. And Israel exchanged the truth for a lie about who God was. God's character, God's nature, God's being is his top priority That because that is the truth. And any time we distort anything about him, we are now in a lie. And we want to get away from this lie. We want to, in our heads, not let the lies permeate, but let the truth be considered. So that we, if we're going to pursue anything, it's to pursue him. Um, so, back to David Platt. David Platt, in his discussion about um, what, it, what results when we begin to see God for who he is, and I think Brandy put some lines at the end of your lesson if you need to write any of these down. Because I, when, he, when he said this, after looking at the nature of God, I so agreed with this, and I realized I don't know what to do with myself because of it. But I, he's working on it. So these are things that we will begin to see when we see God for who he is. Number one, routine religion is no longer tolerable. tolerable. Routine religion is no longer tolerable. The church is the queen of routine religion right now. But if we know God for who he is, there is no routine. There is no routine religion anymore because he's that profound. Never should a God like that be approached in a routine or presumptuous manner, ever. Number two, casual worship is no longer possible. How in the world do we just come and give our hallelujahs, yeah, amen, raise our hands to this kind of God without looking at who he is a little more closely? And we'll go into these. I just wanted, I just thought these were what I want to be the outcome of what we do here for the next six weeks. So routine religion is no longer tolerable. Casual worship is no longer possible. Total surrender is no longer negotiable. This is where I said, this is scary. This is where we need people who are serious about who God is and what they want to do with him. Because if we do this, our surrender to him will not be negotiable anymore. Our worship will no longer be casual. Our, our religion will no longer be routine. It's going to shape it, up, it better. Either that or we're playing with the God who really isn't worth our time. And I don't believe that's true. I want him to knock ourselves up. I want him to shake us up. I want his, him to just hit us up in the head and say, wait a minute, what are you thinking? What are you, what, are you, what are you doing with me? And I think that this study will do that. So be prepared for that. So that's why I wanted to start, that that's why we're here. Yes. Total surrender is no longer negotiable. So there is no halfway. You're either in or you're not. Um, that would be the thing. So, seriousness about this. Um, then I would like you to, uh, I'd like to read to you, I need one of the books. The other reason that I think um, Shri and I were talking about this. Do um, you want the bigger print limit? If I could just find the chapter, I'm not used to the you know, self-sufficiency of God, I think it was the last, second, last chapter. It says this. If all of this, meaning all the, many of these things about God, and trust me, this will be what happens when we study it, appears self-contradictory. If we stand saying, this can't just, this just can't be. <coughs> Amen, he says, be it so. Because you know what? 
God is different than we are. Our ability to conceive him of him is not, it's not possible completely. So there's going to be times when we go, I don't get this. I don't even know how this, yep. That's right, that's why he's God and I'm not. And it's okay. And it's okay to keep struggling with those concepts. Okay, that's what faith is. The various elements of truth stand in perpetual antithesis, sometimes requiring us to believe apparent opposites while we wait for the moment when we shall know as we are known. Did you get what I just said? Sometimes it looks like absolute opposites of what we know as human beings. Sometimes it's just going to look like this is crazy talk. Because God is. He is that. He is crazy talk. Seriously. We do not get who it is that we're dealing with here. And so sometimes it's going to feel like that. The truth, which now appears to be in conflict with itself, will arise in shining unity, and it will be seen that the conflict has not been in the truth, but in our sin-damaged minds. Did you get that? That means that just because we don't understand it or it doesn't seem possible, that's because we have sin-damaged minds. We cannot conceive of this kind of God, and that's okay. We don't throw it out just because we can't understand it. You get what I'm saying? So, he makes that very clear. Your faith is going to be stretched. Your faith in who God is. And therefore, who God is, it will stretch your faith in every other aspect of your life. Everything will be challenged in your life because of it. That's what we want. We want him to challenge us. If we're going to grow, that's what it takes. So, I wanted to start out with that. Now, I've handed out some lessons, which is lesson one. And you're going to be doing chapters two and three in your book. But I'm going to talk a little bit just so we don't have to do all three chapters in the group. I want to talk about some statements that he made in the prologue and in chapter one. And if you don't have the book, that's okay. I'm just going to read what he says here. And then we're going to kind of look at some of the questions that went with it. So what I wanted us to notice mostly in the prologue is that in the very first sentence, anybody have the book with them? Okay. Okay. Some of you guys the book, read the first sentence for me in the prologue. Yeah. You want questions? Okay, here you go. You, the leaders have. You have the word number. <laughs> so I didn't count on you. But. In the preface, Linda? Yes, in the preface. Can you read the first sentence for me? True religion confronts earth with heaven and brings eternity to bear upon time. Very good. She said true religion. True religion, the true worship of God, confronts earth. In other words, it brings down upon earth with heaven and brings eternity to bear on time. We are dealing with heavenly, eternal things here, and we are, it's confronting the earth with it, not the other way around. Which means that we are not here to fit God into us. We're to be confronted with it, with the reality of what that is. Do you see what I'm saying? So, and it will be that. It'll, like I said, it'll seem like an antithesis many times. But that's because we're, we're talking about heaven and eternity here is what we're trying to understand. And we're trying to understand how does that fit in this world? Okay? How, how do we make sense of this world? But we have to know that first because we're trying to confront the earth with it. We bring heaven down with us because of the spirit of God in us. So this, if we don't know God and he's the one who's confronting the earth with himself, we're, we're already in loss. So, very important. Number two, which is in paragraph three. I'll read that one. The low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the case of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. Meaning that a big portion of the chaos of this world is because we have a low view of God. That's why the world is in chaos. We have a low view of God. And that's what he's saying. A whole new philosophy of the Christian life has resulted from this one basic error in our religious thinking. So a low view of God has resulted in a whole new philosophy of what the church is. And it, most of the time it's false. That's our problem. We believe lies about who we are and what this should look like. So we're going to be confronted with some truths that should radically change that. Okay, chapter one. And those of you who have the, the, the questions... I'm going to read some, some uh, quotes from chapter 1 that I want you to pay special attention to. Again, this is all introductory to let you understand what he's kind of thinking, what we're thinking, and in going into this. Number 1. All the problems of heaven and earth 
though they were to confront us together and at all once, would be nothing compared with the overwhelming problem of God. Did you get that? All of the problems of heaven and earth, if they were to confront us all at one time, all of the chaos that we see in this world right now, all of the sin, all of, we, all of the evil, are nothing compared with the overwhelming problem of God. What do we do with God? Because that's really the issue. That's really the human condition. What are we going to do with God? Because whether we believe in Him or not does not mean He does not exist. And something must be done with that. That's why we're here. Um, that He is, what He is like, and what we as moral beings must do about Him. There is no more serious problem to be confronted than what He is, what He is like, and what are we supposed to do with that. Because see, without Him, we have no identity. Isn't that what we see in the world today? Life really is meaningless. And that's what the world is living. But if we believe He is, then who He is, and how we respond to Him, there is nothing more important than that to us. That is life. That is it. Okay. Uh, number two, I wanted to read this one. Uh, let us beware, lest we in our pride accept the erroneous notion, and you guys can go back in chapter one and read these. The erroneous notion that idolatry consists only in kneeling before visible objects of adoration, and that civilized people are therefore free from it. I don't know about any of you. Do you guys have a, like a statue in your house that you bow down to? No, we don't. That's so. So we're thinking we we don't worship idols. We don't have anything like that in our house. The essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. That is what he says is idolatry. Thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. It begins in the mind and may be present where no overt acts of worship have taken place. It, it just happens all the time. Wrong thoughts about who he is. Romans 121 says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him, as God. Notice that they know him, but didn't honor him as God. That means they had wrong ideas about him. Or give thanks. And they became futile in their speculation, speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's what happens when we know God, but get, get wrong ideas about God. Our hearts are darkened. We don't want God. Then number three, the heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is much, once more worthy of him and of her. The heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is once more worthy of him and of her. Profound statement. That's why we're here. That's what, that's what this book is about. That's what Tozer wants to do. That's what scripture wants to do. That's what we want to do right now is elevate our concepts of God to a place that is worthy of him and of us. That's what will change the world. Okay, so your questions, number one, do you think Tozer's statement, this was in sentence two of the book, of chapter one, he says, no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Think about that for a second. No religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Is that a true statement, do you think, and why? Anybody? No religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. What do you think that means, and why would that be true? Uh-huh. Yep. Exactly. Very well said. That's exactly right. Our, 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 our success as the body of Christ will only go as far as we elevate him. However, however exalted Christ is in our life, or, or I did God is in our life, that's what we're going to be as a church. Do you think there's problems in the church today? We clearly have not elevated him to the place that he's supposed to be. Because again, if we had, there would be no routine religion, there would be no casual worship, and our total surrender would not be optional. Right? If we really understood God for who he is. So I think Tozer's right on when he says that. And I think that the scripture validates to us. Number two, why would imperfect thoughts of God lead to wrong doctrine? Why would imperfect thoughts of God lead to wrong doctrine? Anyone? I have expectations because I have the wrong 
thoughts of God. So then I, my doctrine is actually built around the expectations I have. Because I think God does this, and therefore now I'm expecting him to do it. And when he doesn't, now God's not what I thought he was. Anybody ever had that problem? Have we all expected God to do something and he didn't do it? And we're like, what the heck? Where are you? What are you doing? Is, is God even involved in this? That is blasphemous. We talked about that before. That's blasphemous right there. Because really when we say, are you really here? Are you really doing... That's to say that you really don't exist. Because he says he is here. And that he is doing something. That's his promise. So it immediately just leads us to wrong ideas. And then we create... That's, that was my problem. And still is. I still do it. I'm not saying I, I'm healed from all of that. But my, my initial problem is I, I came into the study because I had built in my mind some ideas about God. And it's like, okay, I'm not even seeing you in this. You're not doing anything in this. You are not even active. I don't even know if you exist in this. And so, therefore, I was in a state of blasphemy against him. And I had to find out, what, why is that? Why? You know, seriously, when we have those kinds of thoughts, we immediately need to say, okay, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Right? We, we, we are just wrong. It doesn't matter what it makes us feel like. It doesn't, any of those things. We're just wrong. Either that or God does not exist. Those are our choices. We, it, because if we're right, he does not exist. He is not anything that he said about himself. We need to consider that. It will always lead to wrong doctrine. It will always re lead to wrong concepts of God. If we don't have perfect thoughts about him. If we, I shouldn't say we'll never have perfect thoughts about him. But if we continue in many of the imperfect thoughts about him. It will always lead us to a wrong conclusion because of who we are as people. I'd that, rather I was wrong than he's wrong. Absolutely. Because I'm, I'm fallible. That's okay. If that's wrong, right. we're in super big trouble. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yep. So in this study, what I want you to say, when we get to the place where we're like, okay, that just totally is, I want you to say, okay, either I'm wrong or there's still something I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's, it's not that this is just black, this is just not even going to work. No, we just continue to pursue who he is. Because more than likely, we're wrong. Right? That's more than likely what it is. But it's hard to find out you're wrong and have to change. And I totally had to change. My doctrine has radically changed because I was determining scripture. I was defining the meaning of scripture by my own perceptions of who I thought God was. That's what I had done. And when I found out who he is, I realized all those perceptions had to be wrong. Because those things that I thought of him couldn't even be true if that's who he is. That's why that is so important. Yes, it will lead to wrong. It will lead to wrong. It will lead to despair. Is where it will lead to. Number three. How does Tozer define the idolatrous heart in paragraph twelve of chapter one? Anybody want to quick find that paragraph? Paragraph twelve. You have it, Sheree? So, Sheree, how does he define the idolatrous heart? Um, Stand up and turn around so they can hear you, please. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than He is in itself a monstrous sin and substitutes for the true God one made after its own likeness. So read that again really loud. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than he is, in itself a monstrous sin, and substitutes for the true God one made after its own likeness. There we are. I don't think there's anybody here that's not guilty of that. That's why we're here. An idolatrous heart is one who believes wrong things about God. That's idolatry. And then creates a God that we've conceived in our own mind. Wow. Yes. I, you know what? I want a bigger God than that. I don't know about you, but I want a bigger God than I can comprehend, than I can create. Like Brandy said, I would rather be wrong and him be right. I'd rather admit that. Because if I don't, I have to distort who he is to fit, to fit my own mind. And that kind of God is not sufficient for us, I can guarantee you. Because you know what then he is then? He's just like us. We don't want that. He's not like us. He's not anything like us. And we have to capture that reality. So, I'm going to set you free. Can I say that? Yes, I'm sorry, Barbara. Oh, um, I'll just start class. I'm going to talk to you this month. This is something temporal that sets itself over the future. I would say so. Anything temporal that sets itself over That's why it said we were, we're, we're serving, we're learning about it. Eternal God. We're bringing heaven to earth here. So temporal cannot explain him. The Spirit of God only can explain him. You'll see that in verses. Now, what, as I said, what we're trying to do is, what, in the questions, um, we will use Tozer's uh, phrases and some of the things he says, and then we will validate David with Scripture. 
We're still about, pursue is still about studying scripture. It's not studying Tozer. Tozer. We are studying scripture. And we are using him as a thought process to, to get us there. Okay? He stimulates questions. That's right. He stimulates the questions. He gives the ideas in ways that you just go, wow, okay, I, I never thought about that. And that's exactly what I want us all to go away from here going, I just never thought about that. And I need to think about it. Not that now I have all the answers and I've got all the because we won't. Because we'll probably gain a lot more questions than we will answers. But at least it will make us think about things that we never thought before. And then it will take us to where, okay, if this is true about God, then this has to be true, and this has to be true, and this has to be true in my life. Where I thought it wasn't. So that's our goal. Okay, so uh, you are free to go to your groups. Like I said, there's some books in, the, in, the, uh, in your group times. And we can combine some groups if we need to because we're smaller than in the summer than in the fall. Uh, so that works too. Uh, so if you get in your group and there's only a couple people, <laughs> just yeah, just take her with you. So you can go with her. Yeah. Everybody's free to go to your groups.